And then I've got lab coming up. What got it? Oh, we're ready. Direct. Yeah. Oh. Well, welcome, everyone. Welcome. So good to see you. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Abner Genesee, and I am chair of CTG's workshop committee that puts this all together. And I'm thrilled to see you, all of you out there and everyone here as they're still filing in uh, at this year's Unified Auditions Workshop. And before we start, we honor elders past, present, and future and those who have stewarded this land throughout Great. generations. Right. We also is. recognize Great. that government, academic, and cultural institutions were founded upon and continue to enact exclusions and erasures of indigenous peoples. Note that the following is being recorded and will be available online at a later date. If you're joining us in person, please turn off your Wi-Fi so as not to interfere with our Zoom signal here. Thanks. We're thrilled to see folks online and in person tonight. Those with access needs are welcome to let us know here or on the chat thread. We want to thank the Aurora Fox Arts Center and invite you to enjoy free refreshments in the lobby after the workshop. This is volunteer work that we offer the community. This workshop is one of many events that CTG offers its members. For more information about membership or how you can help, go to coloradotheaterguild.org. Again, that's Colorado Theater, spelled T-R-E, guild.org. I'm thrilled and honored to introduce the host of tonight's event. He is one of the community's most brilliant and prolific theater makers. Please join me in welcoming Steve Wilson. Hi, everybody. Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome, welcome. Uh, we'll go to the next slide, and we're just going to... Um, we're, we're, uh, Betty and I are hosting. Betty will introduce herself in a minute. Uh, I'm Steve Wilson. I am the CTG Chair of the Unified Auditions Committee. That's my claim to fame tonight. Um, but I am the Executive Artistic Director for Center Stage Theater Company, which is a youth company in Louisville. And on occasion, I do some directing. Uh, I just directed Matilda for Robert Michael at Town Hall. And uh, if you can make it up to Johnstown, I directed Crazy for You at Candlelight uh, Theater Playhouse. So uh, lots of stuff going on for me. Um, well, Betty, why don't you introduce yourself? Um, why don't you introduce yourself? <laughs> and then we'll then I'll do the outline. Come on, come on up. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Betty Hart. My pronouns are she, her. I have the great honor of being the president of the Colorado Theater Guild, which means I do what you ask me to for free. So um, that is what I do, and I'm happy to do it. Um, I am an actor in town, a director in town, and I am also one of three co artistic directors for local theater company. Next project coming up is Local Lab. If you are interested in new work, we have a festival of plays that will take place February 15th through the 17th at the Dairy. And you can find out more information about that by going to localtheaterco.org, theater spelled E-R. So <laughs> thank you for taking that up, Abner, so we can have both of those things. Um, and I'm super excited that you all are here to learn more about the Unified Auditions. The goal behind it is to give performers an opportunity to be seen by producers who do and don't know them and to introduce to producers incredible talent that may never come through their door if they didn't get a direct ask. So that's what it's all about. And we'll talk more about that in a bit. Awesome. So we'll go to the next slide. Thank you, Ben. Uh, I'm just going to give a quick overview. So, um, we uh we're gonna do a little bit of logistics on this year's unified auditions which i think is why most of you are here uh then we'll do a quick question and answer about that the idea is if you just want to learn about the logistics then uh, you'll be done uh then we're going to do some audition best practices just some general uh best practices for auditions and then we're going to have an uh, amazing panel discussion uh, with our guest panelists who we'll introduce a little bit later in the evening. And then, of course, as Abner mentioned, we will do our mixer in the lobby for those of you that are here. All right. So I will now hand it over to the wonderful Ms. Betty Park. And uh, for our friends.
friends on Zoom, the incredible Leah um, is going to be there. So if you have questions or anything, Leah is there ready to respond to you and will also bring your questions to us. So please know that we are very excited that you are with us. We want you to have your needs met and Leah is ready and waiting if you do need any assistance. And just so you know, Leah's pronouns are they and she and Leah. So if you reach out, that's how you can reach out to Leah. Thanks. Excellent. All right, what well, you need to know. This is our second annual Unified Auditions. We just created it last year here in uh, Colorado. It is the largest Unified Auditions on the West Coast. What, what? We're very excited about it. Um, Colorado actors from around the state, and that is true. We had people who came from Creed. We had people who came from the mountains. It is for Northern Colorado, Southern Colorado, the mountains. It is for all of us, and including Denver metro area, and it will take place soon. Um, it is open to both union and non-union. Uh, performers, and we just said it, it's the largest. It will happen on Sunday, April 21st, and Monday, April 22nd, different times simply because of the weekend. So on Sunday, we're there from 12 to 8. From Monday, we're there from 10 to 6. It will happen in this beautiful theater, the Aurora Fox Art Center. So this is where performers will stand on this stage. We'll talk about check-in in a moment, but that is why we're also here, because if you wanted to get a chance to feel the space, feel the warmth of the room, discover how loud you need to be, this is part of why we're here today. Um, the Unified Auditions changes that we've had from last year. A couple of things you all should know. Whenever we do events of this sort, we always do send out surveys to both the producers and the performers so we can get intelligence from you. We can know our perspective of how it went, but we need to hear from you. And based on that information, we make some changes. Yeah. One of them. And I'm just going to say, we had about 180 actors last year and about 35, 40 uh, theater companies. Yeah. So uh, longer time. Last year, it was only 90 seconds, which was plenty of time to see magic. <laughs> and now we get to see more magic. So you now have two minutes of time. Um, with those two minutes, um, you, we'll talk about what you do with that in a moment. You get more bar parking access. Um, on Sunday, parking at Curious was a delight. On Monday, parking at Curious was not a delight <laughs> because of all the businesses and companies nearby. So now you'll be able to park in um, any of the parking lots that are here attached to the Aurora Fox, as well as the library, and as well as the side. So lots more free parking that also includes kind of the vintage parking lot. So just a lot more parking to access this time around. Um, freelance directors are invited. Last year, you had to be a director who was a part of a member organization. So Amanda Bird Wilson, who is the founding artistic director of the Catamounts, was there representing her company. Now, you can be a freelance director as long as you are indeed connected to a member organization so that you may not indeed be on staff, but you still may be working in this community. And so that is an expansion that we have also added. Yeah, the, the hope is to get more eyes of decision makers uh, possibly in the room. So it's sort of value to get. Yeah. And we will ensure that the participating theaters will be more accessible for the performers. Fun fact, we had it on the website. We just had it on the producer page, which didn't help uh, performers. Fun fact. So that's the fun uh, fact. We tried, we made a mistake. We are now correcting it. So we will fix that this year and we will be publishing that list starting Monday of next week. So that's when you'll start to be able to see all the theater companies that have already signed up and that list will continue to uh, be added as it happens. And um, the same for last year, but what's, um, that's not different, but what we will explain it, is. It, it, it isn't different, yeah. but we didn't have it in place when we had the signups right. for actors. Right. So we, we got some feedback and that, that's why we, I put it up here because Got it. it's all in place and been voted on Got it. Uh, in advance of actor signing. So now that we've spoken about what you have no idea, I'll explain what that means. <laughs> so um, to be able to be a part of the Unifies is one of many different offerings that the Colorado Theater Guild, which is a service organization for the state of Colorado, provides. And so the way it works is that um, throughout the year, if a person wants to join, but they are having some financial difficulties, they can apply for funding. And so that includes during this time of year for the Unifies. So it is on the application, making it easier to access and easier for people to note. 
And so that is true throughout the year, but it's also mentioning specifically because we do want as many people to be able to attend as possible. And what's beautiful is that there are three different tiers. You can get full scholarship, $50. You can get partial scholarship, um, which is really nice. And so, because there are quite a few performers who are like, no, no, I want to invest in, I just may not have all of it. So both of those options are out there and we do not question you know, your, your financial, we don't look at your records or anything like that. We are yeah. not the IRS. You don't have to send us your, your, your tax returns uh, mm -hmm. at all. We're all good. And, and just fun fact to we we funded 100% of the asks mm -hmm. last mm -hmm. year. I can guarantee what? that because we don't know exactly what those are going to be, but I am very optimistic. Uh, we'll fund lights on top. Um, and of course, the other change is that we'll be here at the Aurora Fox Art Center this year. All right, who is eligible? These are the general requirements. One, you must be 18 years or older. We know that there are brilliant young people who are working throughout town. That's true. And these auditions are specifically for those 18 and older. Second, you of course must be a member. It's a member service, it's a member benefit. So that's how that works. And- But I just added the, the little note to that. Do not have to be a paid member to apply to become, to be part of the audition. Right. You only need a membership once you are accepted into the auditions, you know, before you audition. Right. So, you know, we had some people that have like emailed me, hey, I've, I've, I've got my membership so that I can apply. You don't need a membership in order to apply. You only need that if you get selected to audition. Nice, and we covered funding. Yep. Uh, but once again, if you do need assistance, we are happy to make that happen. And it is a first come first serve. So we have a, a pot of money, if you will. And once that money is depleted, then we will either go to the community to replenish that pot or see what happens if, if that happens. And, and the funding request is all, it's all built into the application. Some of you maybe have already signed up, so you know that, but um, once you go into the application to you know, do name and resume and all of that stuff, there's questions there. So you're, you, it's, it's really one-stop shopping. You really should just have to fill out that Google sheet if there's no changes one time and then you know you don't have to do anything until you come to lunch. Nice. Um, if you are at a union, we do ask you to disclose that information, mostly because producers want to know. And um, that you should generally be available to work throughout the year. So what that means is um, if you know that for 11 months of the year you're already booked, please don't audition. People can't cast you, and that's just sad. So that's what it means. It doesn't mean if you already have things on the books, you shouldn't audition. It just means if you don't have any real flexibility throughout the year, then maybe don't audition because they can't cast you, and that'll just make producers sad. Um, you have to meet at least one of the following experience requirements. Either have five performance credits, that would be true for any of the member theaters in the Colorado Theater Guild, as well as those few theaters that are not members, um, and or be graduating this year from a theater program or have graduated in the past two years. So those are the two things. Um, what that means is that if your only credits are high school or college, that means you would not qualify, but anything in terms of your community theaters, your professional theaters, your semi-professional theaters, all of that counts in terms of if you have five credits. And uh, and that's all it is. And we'll talk more about um, honesty in talking about your credits <laughs> in the best practices. Um, let's see. Oh, wait, there's another thing. Oh, yes, uh, thank you. The screening committee is made up of a diverse group of individuals in all of the different regions, so Northern Colorado, Southern Colorado, Denver Metro, and the mountains. And they are the ones who peruse every single resume and go ahead and take a look at everything. And as a person who had the privilege of serving on that committee last year, we most certainly did do research. So there were people who had theater companies that did not exist never existed, for example, um, as well as people who gave us great information and we got to learn about amazing theaters that are happening all over the country. So that is our job to go through and then to be able to just be able to say, yes, they meet the qualifications, no, they do not meet the qualifications based on what you put in your resumes. All right, here's the process. Pre-screening, uh, you have an audition application, you have your performance resume and a current headshot. And, and I added this today, plus I keep having to fix these. If you go through the application, 
this is really dorky t david you will appreciate this uh the labeling of your resume and your picture is important because it's not just your picture and resume it's you know 180 other pictures and resumes that producers and directors need to access easily so now i i'm going in and fixing them if you if you made a mistake or didn't do it um but that's just my little my little nudge if you haven't done it uh make sure and you online too uh make sure you're looking at that uh how, how to label your book Awesome. So based on that, you would have last name, first name, CTG24. So basically, if I were doing it, it would say heart.betty.ctg24.hsres. Right. Well, it would be HS if it's just your headshot, and then a separate document okay. with res if it's just your resume, or this would be for if HS you combine your, you know, one PDF document or whatever document yes. in, into both, which is, you can do either, but that's the... The labeling system. Thank you for that <laughs> clarification. Um, okay, so you have to submit that, and then your selection happens based on your qualification criteria. Everyone will be notified by early April 2024. That's important to note because you could have signed up last month, and you may be saying, why haven't I heard anything yet? It's because the deadline hasn't closed yet, so you can't hear anything yet. But everyone will be told one way or the other the top of April 2020. Yeah, and, and I didn't put the deadline here, but the deadline, it's online. It's Sunday, March 10th, is the deadline for actors to submit uh, their materials. Nice. And um, if it turns out, because our hope is to see over 180 people this year, if it turns out that, say, 300 performers submit for what perhaps could be 200 slots, if that lovely, delicious, horrible dilemma happens, then this next part is here. If actor interest exceeds spots available, we will prioritize underserved populations, including recent graduates, BIPOC individuals, and individuals with disabilities. So that's how that works. If it happens, we will not know. All of you will help us to spread the word, and we will know more after March 10th. We won't know until then. And that also answers if you had a question about why are those questions on the actor application that that's fine. Thanks. And of course, for your materials for audition, you only need your application. Once you've submitted that, you do not need to resubmit material. So that's it. Just one time, one time only is that. And okay, there's going to be parking, which we talked about already. They are true. There's parking on the, in the parking lot in front of the studio. There's here on the side of Aurora, behind the Fox as well. And you can park next door on the library or on the street or in the vintage parking lot. There's a lot of parking nearby. Check in. You will check in at the studio theater as opposed to coming into the main stage of the Fox. You'll check in at the studio. Um, you will and you will actually do everything from the studio. You will enter from the studio when you are called in and you'll exit and then exit back. So everything is through the studio. So for those of you who worked here and you're used to coming through the gate with a code, we are not giving out a code. Don't come through the gate. No one will be there to answer you. Everything for the performers will be through the studio. Yeah, for, 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 if you've not been to the box and you're online, obviously you guys have been to the box. Uh, but if you're online, you're going to go to your left as you're facing the building. There's a little parking lot, lot of signage as well. Um, very easy, easy to access. But actors will gather there, and then producers and directors will be in the main house. In terms of accessibility, there are ramps into the studio theater, um, and there are no stairs to get in because you'll just roll in or walk in from the right there. And there will be time slots, which is what we did last year as well. You'll be scheduled in one hour blocks. It just makes it a little easier than telling you you have to be here at 11.05. Traffic could cause you to get here at 11.12, right? So it's a one hour block. You're in the 11 o'clock time frame. We encourage everyone to get here as close to 11 as possible. And then we'll see you in the order that you arrive. Yeah, and it's a little odd, but it worked out really well last year. So again, if you end up being late for whatever reason, you don't get a time. So you don't, you get an hour slot. But if you end up being a little late, you just end up at the end of that slot. Um, it, it worked out really well. Nice. Um, time limit, you have up to two minutes of time. This could include two monologues. It could include a monologue and a song. How you compose that is completely up to you, oh magic performers that you are. Um, your introduction does not count as your two minutes. So we would ask you to say your name. So I might say, hi, I'm Betty Hart. And I might say, if, if it were not clear or if I've had 
people questioning what my gender is or they don't know my pronouns, I might say, I'm Betty Hart, my pronouns are she, her. And I take a breath and then I go. We will not time you for your introduction. However, your introduction is really to give us your name. It is not to give us your political affiliation, your zodiac sign. It is not for any of that. It really is just to give or, us your name. Or even introduce your pieces. Or, or right. Because obviously we have a lot of actors to try to move as quickly as we can. So stage management will be capturing that information, what pieces you're doing. Directors and producers will have access to that online when they're in the house. So we, we don't need it. So it's really just your names. We want to make sure that, you know, obviously we're evaluating the right person and then the way you Yeah. And it is not um, such a pressured situation that the moment you say your name, you've got to go. So it isn't, Betty Hart, I left the ring. You have a moment. You can take a moment. Please take your moment. Please be centered. Please be grounded. You know, you don't have 20 minutes of moments, but you have a moment because we want you to be able to bring your best. We want to support you every single step of the way. And taking that beat is crucial to you being able to tell the story of your monologue or song. Yeah, and timers don't start until words come out of your um, there will be an accompanist. We have an amazing one. Um, there's no pre-recorded accompaniment or self-accompaniment or a cappella singing. Um, the number one reason for that is that producers are going to have accompanists for you. So they want to see how you interact and get to just have the gift of telling the story without having to worry about doing anything else. There are shows where you have to do both. You do not have to do that for the new ones. All right, uh, that is a bunch of stuff. We're gonna take a little pause to see if you have any questions about any of the logistics that we have covered, or perhaps there's something that we didn't cover with logistics that you would like to know about. Yes? I have two questions. First is, if you know an actor, do you want to know if you But unfortunately, we have to have a comment. Is there a way for them to send in uh, a video to the computer? Thank you. So for our audience members who are not here, the question is, if there are performers who would like to come to the Unified Auditions but will be out of town for any number of reasons, is there a way for them to be able to do a self-tape to be included in the mix? The answer currently is no, it is all live auditions, but that does bring me to something that we did not mention. All of the Unified Auditions, which are held live, we have the amazing Ray Bailey's company who will be filming these auditions because of a few things. One, after seeing 200 auditions, we may not be as crystal clear about audition number 37 as we would like. <laughs> so it allows the producers to be able to go back and remember why they wrote the note to see you again. It allows them to be able to look and see the genius that is you. So that does indeed happen. So thank you for teeing that up. But yeah, you know, I, I, I just also wanted to say, that obviously there, there's a lot of time that might pass between a producer watching the combined audition and cap show. So I know what happened last year is I, I had some artistic director friends that when you know they 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 tried to cast a show, but they needed a specific type of actor, and then they went back to look at the unifieds, and then they could look at that specific audition spot. Yes. Second question. Yes. Um, I read your or you said you direct your director, but I didn't get a confirmation. Diane, that's that's because we haven't yet seated the producer observers. So you will get that email as soon as we've seen them. So that hasn't happened. So, so you can't, I produce you can't actually write You 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 you're good. We got your we got your application. It's all good. We just haven't. Because of this, because of the house, we would like to see how big the group is before, but it, it's coming very soon. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's all good. It's all good. We will, we will definitely be confirming well before the event in April. Um, that, that is not a step we've done. We haven't kind of seated the folks there. And also just that what will be helpful is on Monday of next week, we're going to publish the list of producers. So you'll always be able to go on and see. And if you see your name, you're like, great, I know they've got it. If you don't see your name, you can do a check-in and say, hey, I didn't see my name. And yet there's other companies. So yep. that becomes- But different. you're good. <laughs> so you're awful. Is there a reason? 
It'll be it, on the website. It'll be on the website on, on Monday. Yeah. And that's a that that's a dynamic list that'll you know get bigger as more producers sign up. Yeah. So it will only have the producers. Right. We do not publish the names of performers. Um, it's on Google. And actually, let's um, let's help out them because that's a great question yeah. for producers. The question is: um, Is there a sheet with the list of performers? And what happens is there are a series of documents that the amazing Steve Wilson will email to all of the producers that has all of the information of the performers, as well as a link to the Google Drive, where you'll be able to access the headshots, the resumes, and be able to write notes. Yeah, and then there's a there's a, there's a Google document too that stage management literally in the studio theater is updating in real time because what we don't know in advance of the auditions is the exact order, but stage management takes that again. We do this funky thing, which is that the actors don't get a time slot like in some auditions. They get an hour block, and then their order is dictated by the when they arrive. So we don't even know that in advance. So you get access to that Google document, which has every actor in the order you're gonna see them, as well as the pieces they're doing and other information about them, as well as the Google Drive that has their pictures and messages. Correct. Correct. It's all correct. Correct. And you could be looking at their resume. It's all digital, though. No, in, in the old, old days, many years ago, we used to have these big books and stacks that we would give to, to directors. But we weren't as environmentally yeah, friendly. There it is. Very, now. very bad. Yeah. You bet. Awesome. Leah, do you have any questions? I have a number. Great. Um, so Where are we? I graduated from theater school in 2022. I have three community slash study pro credits currently. Does that mean I am not eligible? If they graduated in 2022, which is one of the last two years, is that right? Or is it would only yeah, two years ago, yeah, right? Yeah, so they, they qualify under that. Um, that provision. Yes, that so they, provision. Would, they would not qualify they would not qualify the uh the five performance credits, but they would as a recent graduate. As a recent graduate. And we should remember to repeat the question just in case they can't hear. So we apologies. We want to make sure that yep. you all hear it. Yep. Yes. Those are um, yeah. Second question, it's two people with the same question. Is it possible to do a, just do one monologue that would be for two minutes of choice? Great. So the question is, is it possible to do one monologue for two minutes? And that is all. The answer is, it is completely up to you. You can do one, you can do two, you can do two and a song. It is up to you. Um, we'll talk in terms of best practices and with the panel about what are some thoughts from directors about what you might want to choose. But in terms of the answer to your question, the answer is yes, you can. There it is. And I'm laughing because Betty and I talked last year about can somebody do one song? You could do one song. You can do whatever you want. It's your two minutes. Um, personally, as a director, I think that is selling yourself short because even if you're in a musical, oh, I know, but this is specific to that question. So you probably don't want to do one song, but it's up to you. Go for it, Leah. Um, if we've already applied, do we need to reapply with the requested naming convention with their documents? No, Steve's already let's fixed it. Let's repeat the question. Oh, yes. Uh, the question is, if you've already applied, do you need to reapply with the specific the specific naming of the file as I outlined before, and the answer is no. I have renamed all the files appropriately. I'm just trying to make it cleaner for now. All good. Um, in terms of order, is there a preference for the first song or monologue first? That that will defer. Yes. So first question, that because it's a two part question. So first part is: Is there a preference in terms of song or monologue? And it is completely first. up to you, which goes first. What we will tell you will happen is when you enter, you will talk to the accompanist and you will walk, work out with them what your tempo is and also when it is you want to begin. Often people will put in the sheet music, begin when I say the word blank. So you will say, perhaps if you end your monologue with, and that's funny, you'll write, and that's funny. And then the moment you say that's funny, they would begin to play. And then you would sing if you chose monologue first and then song. It is completely up to you. What I would say is whatever you can do strongly and fight through the nerves best on first, do first. 
but there are people who sing first. There are people who do monologues first. There really is no conventional wisdom yep. about which is best. And the second part? Yeah, the second part of the question is, will there be an almost time up, time upside, or will they just be oh, Great question. So the, the second part of the question is, will there be an almost time up, or is it just time when the two minutes is up? That is a new question. Do you have any thoughts? Yeah, I I, I was trying to remember if we did that last year, we and did. I don't think we did. we did. So we will, we don't know yet, but we'll take that under advisement, a little... Uh, we do have a timer, so that's not impossible to do. Um, no problem. Well, like a 10 seconds. Yeah. So we'll probably have, we'll we'll decide what that is. And uh, all actors, by the way, we'll get a substantive email uh both once we select you for an audition, you'll get your slot, as well as a set of you know rules. And some of it will be a repeat of what you heard tonight, but some of it will be specific to the day of the audition. But that's a suggestion that we Great have idea. not heard at all. Yep. So thank you so much for your question, yep. and we'll Great. get back to you. Exactly. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And Leah, did you have any more? Yes, I have one last two part question. When auditioning, should I identify the character and play before beginning? The question is, should you identify the character and the piece before you do your audition? It is a resounding no. We simply want you to do it because you already have the opportunity to identify the character in piece with the stage managers before you come out. So we already have that up on our screens. All we want to see you do is do it. And that's a great question because slating can be different in different environments. There is slating where you have to identify the pieces and slating where you do not have to identify the pieces. This is one of those opportunities where you do not have to identify the pieces to us because you've already told the stage managers backstage. It also means that you can decide five seconds before you check in with your stage manager what you're going to do. So if you've got three or four pieces you're not sure, or you last night you just did it with your friend and it's amazing, um, you can make that decision last minute. So we're not capturing that information. Yeah. yeah. The second part, yeah. If so, would that count as my second? Could you already answer that? Um, last question for this round. I think this may have already been answered, but they would like it repeated. What will happen if there are more qualified auditionees than there are spots? So this question is, uh, what will happen if there are more qualified auditionees than slots to see them? And what will happen is, if indeed that happens, then we will prioritize those who are in underrepresented categories, including those who have disabilities, those who are recent graduates, and those who are members of the BIPOC community. Thank you for asking that. We're good on that. Okay, great. great. Any other and questions in the audience? The audience. Yeah. Um, I'm going back to the slate. Um, so <laughs> just for clarification, in our slate, um, all we're doing is just names and pronouns. If we speak. If we're comfortable okay. right i mean really really the only one we're requiring is is name but yeah. i think pronouns is great yeah and if, i opened up pronouns because not clear. there are individuals yep. in our community yep. who have Absolutely. been misgendered yep. and so it's a very quick thing to be able to yep. do for people who do not know yeah yep. okay perfect thank you thank yep. you i know that's right so um just wanted to know if it has to be either specific or if it could possibly be from a film great but, okay we have a question of for your monologue, does it have to be theater specific or could it be from a film? It is completely up to you, the individual. When we get the other panelists up here, we may bring that question back yep. in terms of preferences, yep. but in terms of choice, you are in choice. Yep, thanks. Uh, in the back, yes. Me? Yes. Okay. <laughs> uh, I mean, you know, you know, myself, but uh, <laughs> what was the response to the um, Good question. Yeah, so, first Go ahead. Gotta yeah. so the question is, what does response from the theater companies who are in the audience look like from the performer's standpoint? How will they know what happens next? I'll let you start with that. Yeah, uh, it, it is from the theater companies. So traditionally what happens after these larger unified auditions is you get a call probably to either go to a callback or in some, or in some cases, you know, audition for a specific show, which might be the whole process, the set of audition and the callbacks. We're sort of hoping that some of you will get to skip that step. It's, it's relatively unlikely though. It's not impossible that you would be cast 
directly from this particular audition, but you, you your your contact information is included. All the directors and producers have that, so they would be reaching out to you to say, "Hey, you know, we loved your audition. We would love it if you would come to the callbacks for this particular show, or or whatever, come to the initial auditions, or or whatever whatever that opportunity is." Yeah, but theaters will either email or call you directly. Um, it does not come through CTG. Right. They reach out to you specifically. Uh, actually, uh, Adrian. Just a clarification. You must be a um, member prior to audition audition. Right. So, not, so you have to repeat the yes. question. Yes. Okay. So the, the question was, uh, do you have to be a member prior to audition? Yeah. So... You do not have to be a member in order to make an application to get an audition. Because remember, we, you might not be selected. Again, if we have that situation where we've got 300 actors applying and only 200 slots, then not everyone will make it in. Um, last year, everybody did make it in, so we don't know what's going to happen this year. Once you are selected for the audition, that is the moment at which you need to either get a membership or if you've mentioned it that you need a scholarship, then we would let you know what that funding level would be at. Second part of that. Is it still $50? Yes, it's still $50 to be an individual member of the community. And it, sorry? 25 dollars for students yep. thank you so much yep. thanks for clarifying. and also one of the things that we are looking at because we don't know um and we we hope to have the lovely problem of having too many people and not enough slots we are looking at creating a tier where we can have alternates because what if something happens on the day of and someone can't be there we the producers want to see the people so we are looking into that we don't have any details for you today because we've got a few months to figure it out but know that that is also something that we are contemplating because there are people who are like hey just tell me when and i'm going to be there and i've got my stuff together and i'm ready so that may also be another way for more people to be seen in the event that some people either take less time than we anticipated because we have to presume everyone takes the two minutes but everyone doesn't you could take 90 seconds so that could also allow for some more space so that is a great series of questions thank you and i saw yes ma'am my question is related to that the fact that is if you haven't made it um when you say if you haven't made it tell me more of what uh, that means you didn't register a time so you didn't get considered the selection process or you were passed over in the selection process if it's done all anyway then you didn't get some of the process last year there was a lot of extra time so it wasn't and that's exactly what happened so the question is, if you did not get your materials in by the deadline, could you just take your chances and just show up here at the box, say at 3 p.m. because it feels good, and hope that you can get seen? The answer is no, because <laughs> we have so much information that we give the producers, your headshot, your resume, all of this great information. So it would literally create all kinds of a nightmare of producers saying, hey, I don't see their headshot. Well, it's not in there. Why not? It would just be a mess. So that is an absolute no. However, if you do indeed apply by the deadline, we are going to create a system by which alternates are possible. So that would be the prospect. But in terms of just showing up, unless you just like the fresh air near the fox, because you just <laughs> like to do that, you can do that. But in terms of coming in, no, that would only be for people who've gone through it, gotten the criteria, gotten the toll, they're, they're here and they're available to come. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Yes. Will actors have access to the film? <laughs> New question. Good and question. Thank you. The question is, We're will working. actors have access to these filmed auditions? And last year, that was an unequivocal no. This year, we are looking into having that available to the actors if they would choose for a nominal fee like a very small amount because they're like, you know what? I gave a great audition. It was filmed by Ray Bailey. I could put this on my website. I could send this out for auditions. That is 100% on our radar. We haven't figured out what it is yet. So thank you for teeing that up. That's another piece of the puzzle that we yep. need to send out in time. 
Yeah, if, 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 if it doesn't happen that we do it this year, we really do want to do it. It's just working out the logistics and the cost of the money and all, all, the, all the stuff. But yeah, good, good question. Brian. Oh. Brian says we should talk about the directory. This wasn't the time for that, but we'll do that or not. So one of the great things that's also happened since last year and since the unified auditions is that now uh, the Colorado Theater Guild hosts a directory where any performer, any designer, anyone who has a skill that could be used in the theater can go ahead on there and submit their resume or their portfolio or a link to their whatever it is, and you can put in the directory what it is that you do, and people from around the state can use it to be able to find you and your skill set. So that is a new thing that's also out there. It's as if you were a board member, dear sir. Thank you for teeing up that question. Any last questions before we move forward? Um, right. Quick question. Is there an approximate idea of how many theater companies will be next? We have no idea. We know it'll be more than last year because theater companies talked about how great the talent pool was and people want to see it. Yep. We, again, we had about 30 last year, so I would think it would be in that ballpark, but it could, could be more. And then um, I mentioned about we have the slideshow that will be available for later. They wanted to know when, where that will be received. So I would mentioned it'll be emailed, but which website will it be? The slides? Yeah. That's a great question. The answer is we don't know because we have a bunch of different places we can place it now and we haven't really discussed it yet. So the question for those of you, in case I didn't repeat it, is where will the slides live? Probably on the CTG website, but at this moment in time, the answer is we do not know 100%. But certainly check the homepage of the CTG website as there would at least be a link to that somewhere on there. There'd be some information about it there. We're, we're yeah. ready to know that. Yeah. Great. Um, with that list of company producers, where would people access that? That list will be on the Unified site on the CTG website. When you click on performers, it will be right there waiting for you, the list of the theaters that will be attending. There, there's a, I think there's text on there now that says, you know, list is coming. So there's no link yet because we don't have a list up yet, but we will have that up on Monday. And so then that'll be, that text will then be a link that'll say theaters are tech. And then last question. Um, should we be able to travel anywhere in the state since producers will be from the whole state? Wow. The question is, should you be able to travel anywhere through the state since there will be producers from around the state? Um, should you? I don't know. Could you? Maybe. Um, if you are a person who only works in one region, that is certainly your autonomy as a performer. So it is completely up to you. However, there are opportunities and there are both paid and non-paid opportunities throughout the state. So it will be up to you to decide what it is you want to do and if it works for you. All right, one last question. Is there a drop-off of theater slash producers attending on the second day? So the, uh, the question is, are do fewer theater companies attend on the Monday than on the Sunday, perhaps? Yeah, I think maybe that. Okay. Yeah. yeah, the stock answer to this one is we, we cannot guarantee that the full list is going to be attendance at any given moment. Sometimes theater producers have, you know, or directors have last minute things. Um, they can attend the entire two days. We want them to attend. But the logistic reality is sometimes they don't. And sometimes it'll be like, person one from say local theater company is here for maybe day one and then another person might be there for the second day. So we can't guarantee, but we can tell you who is signed up and who is likely to be Yeah, but there wasn't a significant drop off um, and the producers were really wowed by the talent that came last year. So there was an incentive to come and see more talent. So know that you are solving problems for producers by showing up and bringing your skills. Awesome. Great. All right, let's uh, <laughs> let's move on, and well, I'll try to move quickly through this section. All right, so we're gonna we're gonna do sort of a basic, quick best practices for general theater auditioning. This is really couched to uh, for this particular uh, experience, and this is meant to be as general as I could make it. 
Um, so just uh, we want we want you to think about the basic mindset. Uh, many actors feel like they're not in control. You know, you don't get to pick yourself in a play. Um, so we want to remind you that you are in control of your preparation. We also hope that actors will enjoy the opportunity to perform. I know that's hard, you're nervous, and you're worried that you might not do well, but if you can really lean into enjoying that two minutes, uh, that will make your audition even better. And we want to remind you that you all have agency, so you can accept or decline callbacks or any offers that are made uh, after your audition experience. Um, so just quickly, some things to keep in mind. Know the material, obviously know your pieces, but also know the shows that those are from, if they are from a show or from a film. Um, please don't wait till the last second before or the night before to do your memorization. Remember, uh, you're gonna be nervous when you get into that room, so you wanna have that uh, memorization done well in advance. We really recommend a pre-audition audience. This, if you have an acting teacher or somebody you know uh, who's in the field, that's great, but it can also be a friend or a family member uh, to take a look at your pieces and give you some uh, mild feedback on what that is so that you're not performing for the first time. Can I yeah, one? please don't. No, one of the great things about doing your piece for other people first is you won't be surprised completely or stunned if you discover that your piece is funny right. or that your piece react. causes a reaction. It's so great if you experience that with other people. It doesn't mean you're clocking it and meaning we're gonna have to do that in here, but it's a beautiful thing to go, oh, I didn't even build in time to be able to pause for laughter. And I chose a highly comedic piece that I ace. It's a great thing to be able to do it with some other people so that you can say, I might take off a little bit so I have room to breathe, room to inhabit, room to experience. Absolutely. Uh, clothing, we just want you to think about what you're wearing. We're not telling you what to wear. Um, it's something that would bring your character to life that's comfortable, that you could move in as a general rule. Uh, but just think about that. That shouldn't be just, uh, oh, I'll wear whatever I want to wear on this day. Food, light and healthy before you audition. Uh, that's just a good, you know, good life uh, thing if you're going to do something that might make you a little nervous. Warm up, everybody does it a little bit differently, but physical and mental warm ups uh, as you get ready to do a big audition like this is important. Resume, we'll talk a little bit uh, more about this at the panel, but clean one page, no lies. Um, <laughs> yes, I won't even say George Santos or anything like that, uh, but lies have gotten a lot of people in trouble. And this theater community, in case you don't know, uh, is very tiny. Many of us know each other. Um, so don't, you know, don't say, oh yeah, I played the lead for Robert Michael at Town Hall because I might be able to pick up the phone and say, hey, this really happened. Um, piece selection, I, I just like to tell actors, don't worry, this is like the life struggle. This is a, it's hard. This part is hard. You're trying to find a monologue or a song that suits you really well, that showcases your talents, and that you love. If, if you can love your pieces, that is ideal. For this kind of audition, when you're not you know, auditioning for whatever, crazy for you or noises off or some specific play, um, you know, find something that you love that highlights you and what you do well. Style, in general, you're going to find pieces that suit you, that highlight your strength. If you're doing two, you're going to press for those two to be contrasting. And I would also say you can actually even do that if you do a song and a monologue. Think about how those pieces contrast to show, you know, the, the, the biggest two we can we can see. Journey, again, a lot of a lot of actors forget about acting, like the acting things you've learned in acting school, super important in a monologue that you are thinking about your character's journey from the beginning when you're say your first word to the end. And that is also true for uh, musical theater, for songs as well. Again, this sort of is a is a uh, reiteration of that. What's your objective? What do you want in that piece? And again, think of it for a song. Even if it's a repetitive song, um, that, that makes it even better. Cutting. Uh, be creative with cutting this material, especially if it's a, uh, again, this is particularly hard, especially for female classical pieces because there's not very many. So you can, we, you can be like, oh my gosh, if I'm trying to do a Shakespeare monologue because I like Shakespeare, there's just very little. So think about creatively cutting it into a way that might be a little different than somebody else did. Order, this was asked on Zoom. That I get this question a million times. Almost every time an actor walks into my audition room, what should I do first? Always do your strongest piece first. 
All directors are different, but most of us make a decision in the first 10 seconds of your audition. So if you're waiting to do the thrilling climax and you do your best piece at the end, I usually advise, do your strongest first. Now, there could be all kinds of reasons you do it differently, but that's the advice here. Uh, two pieces, if you're doing two pieces, which many of you will do for this audition, um, think about the transition between the two pieces. I mean, I joke, it's like that crazy, like high school thing where, you know, I finish my log and like, you know, I'm done, right? And then, oh, you know, I gotta get I'm ready. And then, now I start my second piece, right? Think about this transition as if you were like the brilliant Betty Hart just did, doing a one person show for two minutes. What's that transition that's acted from your monologue to your song or monologue one to monologue two? Think about that as part of the rehearsal process. Um, I, I put these two types of monologues just so you as an actor can identify them. Active monologues are monologues where you are actively trying to get something from another character. Um, usually, not always, these are monologues that you have to cut out of dialogue. Um, and a story monologue is usually that thing when you're going through a play or sometimes a monologue book, and you find that big chunk of text, it's a big story, and then you do your monologue. Those are very common and not as good. Because in, in not in not in all cases, but in some cases, it's a more passive thing. You're not trying to elicit something from another character. So just think about that when you're you're picking stuff. This is not all directors like this, but I'm just going to tell you. For me, um, I love using a chair because it's the one thing you can guarantee is going to be here on this stage. And it's just so if you're in your basement or your room or wherever you're going to rehearse or a rehearsal studio, you've got that that set. Your set is your chair. You can sit on it too if you want to, uh, but you can just use it to walk around or to lean on or whatever. So that sometimes can ground you, you know, in the space if you, it's not a place you've been. Focal points. Um, the key thing here is just it's out over the audience. Generally, you want uh, focal points that are kind of at a 45 degree angle. Usually, you don't want more than three, but if you've got a very complicated piece, you can do more. But we, what we don't want is if I'm here playing to my chair that I just suggest. So if I'm like, hey, I want you to come, then I'm closed off from the people that are here. You try to send your energy out, send your energy out over the audience so the auditors will feel uh, what that is. So never on stage, um, generally out over toward the audience. Moment before, a lot of Peter Hagen talks about this, Mike Schuttler talks about this. Really important to think about an active moment before words are coming out of your mouth. Betty kind of mentioned that. If you, if you have an active thing that happens before you speak, that could also be this like micro warm up for you too to connect uh, with what's happening. Introduction, rehearse this. Um, it always just cracked me up when I taught acting a long time ago for high schoolers. I would have a single class where they just had to do their, their introductions. And it would, be, it would be like, hi, I'm, I'm Steve Wilson. I'm, oh, right. It's being neutral and trying to rehearse that. So that's part of, you know, your character is you saying your intro, is the transition into piece one, is the transition into piece two, and these two. Uh, pace. Just think about it. They're usually too slow, although I've seen actors that are a little, 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 little too fast. So think about pace. No props. Don't bring a prop. No phones. No anything. Don't bring a prop. Be meticulous about timing. Uh, Betty always coaches that, like, please make sure there is enough time so that, you know, if you're timing your piece, I would go with, like, you know, a, a minute 45, right? Um, so that you're not, so that there's time for you to be nervous and to breathe and to uh, And to get a laugh and, and to laugh. go for the yeah. laugh and enjoy that moment. There it is. <laughs> Volume, louder is better. Um, you're not going to be mic'd on this stage, so big theater voices so that we can hear you. Find your light. I think we're going to be good uh, in this space because we'll have more than just like the naked light bulb in the, uh, in the room there. Um, musical theater, if you're going to do a song, you know, uh, uh, vocal coaching is really important. If you don't have a vocal coach, making sure you are, you know, singing right and thinking about all of the specifics for yeah. that, as well as thinking uh, really clearly about what you're preparing for the accompanist. So that that's easy for them to turn pages. Yeah, yes, Betty. I want to just add one thing. It's really important to rehearse your song with an accompanist before the unifieds because... Often the Broadway recording and the music, the sheet music is not the same. And it's a bad time to discover it 
at the Unifieds or in any audition. So please make sure and just go ahead, find a friend or pay someone to play it so that you know that what's on that sheet music is what you're doing. Yep. And it's not the same as what you were listening to on Apple Music, Spotify, or YouTube. Yep. And then, you know, this is why we do it, right? We, we want creative, amazing people. So be creative and enjoy and have fun um, with that part of it. Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, we are now, yay. Okay, now we are going to, thank you very much. Uh, we are going to invite up our panel on the stage. Uh, I am going to try to shut up and moderate. Um, so I will welcome to the stage, we've already introduced Betty. I will welcome to the stage the wonderful Amanda Bird Wilson and Robert Michael Sanders. I'll uh, let you guys introduce yourselves to uh, our live audience and our Zoom audience. Uh, I'm Amanda Burke Wilson. I am the co founder and artistic director of the Catamounts. Uh, we're a Boulder based company dedicated to theater for the adventure of palette. I'm also a freelance director and sometimes actor. Oh, uh, and I uh, have upcoming projects at the Repertory Theater. Um, at Opera Steamboat, and so director out of state. Awesome. Robert? Uh, hi, I'm, my name is Robert Michael Sanders. Uh, I am the Chief Operating Officer at the Town Hall Arts Center, also still an occasional director at large, even a less occasional actor. <laughs> um, and That's a whole nother discussion. <laughs> that's a whole nother discussion, Fred. So, uh, yeah, and, and things that we've got cooking um, just closed here in town, we are opening Raisin the Musical in three weeks, which will be the regional premiere of that show. Uh, and it was a really awesome uh, thing that we get to do. So please come and check us out uh, for that. So that's my point. Uh, uh, I just want to thank everybody. It's a great, diverse panel. Um, these individuals here are fantastic, and uh, I'm honored to be on the stage with them. So my first question is a big one. Which was like, this is the Uber question, which is in one sentence. Or I made it one word, but let's, let's we'll, we'll do we'll do one sentence. What is your number one piece of audition advice for an actor? Does anyone want to start? Uh, yeah. Uh, well, you oh, yeah. know, I was thinking about this today, on this on the car drive down, and I think just do whatever you need to do to show up as you. Like nice. whatever it is that you have to do to get into that space where you feel good in your body feel good with your voice, what's coming out of your mouth, how you're standing on stage, what you're wearing, like do those things because I, for me, I just want to see people who are interesting, who are comfortable in their skin, even if it's like not the best piece or the best, you know, like, but if I have a sense that there's a really like interesting creative artist up there, I forgot. Nice. Um, I'll add, don't judge your piece while you're doing it or after you're doing it until you are a hundred percent off stage <laughs> there is nothing worse than us enjoying you and then you telling us that we shouldn't have because what we saw wasn't good we liked you and then you were because you finished and we're like yes and we're all like and then you went uh, and it's just like, oh no, you told us something we didn't know. We didn't know that there was a problem. You sold it. You did your job. And then you told us we were wrong. <laughs> so please keep that inside until after you clear the door. Then judge away if you have to. But don't let us know because we were enthralled. And then you told us we shouldn't have been. Yeah, both both right. Yeah. Don't tell don't tell us you did it wrong. We might not know. Uh, don't do that. Uh, mine is is really accurate for both of these. And I think part of it to show up as your best you is truly it is be prepared. If you know your material because you didn't memorize it the night before, if you know it and you feel good about it, now you can be you. And we get two minutes to meet you. Like we get two minutes to try to figure out something interesting and unique about that artist. So the piece is part of it, but we do want to see you. So bring that to the table. Your best view is when you feel prepared in that book. Uh, 
Awesome. Excellent. I, I'll, I'll quickly answer this, but it's just a twin on what Betty said, which is just, you are playing a character the whole day. You're playing a character when you walk into the building and check in with the stage manager. And what I usually say is you're playing yourself on a very good day, uh, which, which it might be a very good day, in which case you're great, then just do it. But there are all kinds of, you know, remember, the stage managers, the people that are around, if you're mean to them, we will find out about that. Um, but just, just like that, you know, enjoy the whole experience from beginning till you're back in your car and then you can, you know, do what you want. All right. Uh, just, this is kind of similar, but just any of, any personal do's or don'ts. And I, I should mention that, you know, I kind of did the best practices based on my preferences, but all directors have slightly different preferences, so we might we might disagree about certain things. Um, but any do's or don'ts? Don't wear shoes you've never worn before to an audition. Okay. Uh, yeah, we touched on a little. Don't tell us if you did it wrong. <laughs> don't tell us if you blew it, and don't tell me. Oh, I changed it this morning. I wasn't going to do. Don't don't. <laughs> don't. Uh, do you assume that uh, we are excited about you being there? Yeah. I think it's easy to feel, and I have felt this way as an actor, like that there's this um, antagonism or that there's this hostility that like we're waiting for you to fail. Um, but I, I mean, you know, maybe some asshole directors are like that, but then you don't have to work for them, right? Like right. I would say that my... You know, every single time someone steps on stage, I'm like really hopeful that they're going to be somebody that I'll be excited to work with. I'm going to give another do. Do a piece that people would expect you to do, and then for your second piece, do something that maybe people don't know you could do mm -hmm. because you know you love it. Maybe you're always cast as one type, but you know that there's something else in you. Do that for the second piece. Check the box by giving us what we expect, and then do that second thing that you know that you do better than anybody on earth because it's you, and have that, and enjoy that moment of surprise and epiphany as you reshape how we see you as a performer. Awesome. Uh, I'll just say, don't summarize the play. Uh, that, that happens sometimes where you, you set the plot. Okay, in this scene, uh, yeah, don't do that. Just name or whatever, whatever the slating, the, the, Benny doesn't like that, slating conventions. Um, all right, uh, is there is there anything that is a pet peeve for you? So like something you don't, like I, I kind of mentioned, mentioned one. Um, I, I, uh, I think it's hard because there's not sufficient material out there, but I do not, I, I wish that women would not choose monologues, which are about wanting a, a man to love them, or always from like a, a, a sort of an orientation towards, and this is, this is a, this is a super, you know, specific thing, but I would just encourage women to find material that um, perhaps puts them in a uh, less uh, victim or a subservient yeah. kind of light. Nice. Good. 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 All right. I don't have a lot of pet peeves, personally. I'm kind of open to see what happens, honestly, and just sort of just touches back. I, 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 as all of us, want you to be great. We want you to succeed. So, yeah, my, my pet peeves are are minimal. Um, I have, I'll give you two. I have, I If you don't know Shakespeare and you don't love Shakespeare, don't do Shakespeare. It sets you up badly and it doesn't let us get to see and experience the magic that is you. Bad Shakespeare is painful to watch. Some of you have paid to see it, you know. <laughs> so please don't do that. If you don't have a passion for it, pick other things. There's so many other things in the classical genre if that's what you want to do. Um, the second is don't pick pieces that you believe are going to shock us. So 
dropping F-bombs or whatever aren't going to shock us. And if you don't drop it well, we're just going to be annoyed. So don't try to shock us with your pieces. Pick things that you really love and that you can really bring to life. Um, and then the third thing I would say is really uh, don't expect us to give you something because you can be amazing. And because you're amazing, we are trying to write or type up the notes to be able to remember how amazing you were after today. And that means we may not be able to give you all of the eye contact that you desire because we're trying to do two things, appreciate you and capture the moment. So please don't need something from us. Let your character need something from who they're talking to, but let it not be us because we're there to do the thing to capture info about you so we can contact you in the future. Yeah, I love that one. I think we'll, we'll, we'll deal with that a little bit later as well. Uh, any any stories or memories of just an absolutely outstanding audition for for any reason and why why was it outstanding or amazing? Something I mean, could be from your last show, whatever you just did. I I have one example, um, which was um, a woman that came in to do her audition and literally tripped over the chair on the way in, wiped out. All their music flew out of their book, almost knocked the the keyboard off the stand. Like it was. It was sitcom esque, um, and and I was like, if this is part of the act, this is awesome, <laughs> awesome. It was not. <laughs> they gathered themselves and they were like, I am so I should just go. And I said, you absolutely should not go. I want to see more. <laughs> what what do you have? Um, and they dusted themselves off, sang a phenomenal song, blew me away almost tripped on the chair on the way out. <laughs> and I said, I have got to bring into a callback. It was a phenomenal recovery. And I saw the person, I saw this person in there and it was brilliant. There's so many audition stories and the hardest part is in telling a story that you can tell without saying the actor's name. So if you see right. that, because mm -hmm. we're not trying to do that, there's so many great stories, but I will tell you one story that happened at the Unifieds last year, which was beautiful. Um, a performer came out and they were a little nervous and then they just took a breath and their whole body changed and they just performed with all of their heart and soul. And we could not take our eyes off this individual. And it was this beautiful moment where the person felt like I did that. And we were like, yes, you did. <laughs> and it was just this love fest happening in the silence. And that was really beautiful. And it all started for that performer when they settled their nerves by taking the breath and just doing what they came here to do. And it was glorious. Okay, we good? The, uh, this is obviously the complimentary question to, to this particular topic, which is just, you have a memory of a, an actor who had, who had a challenging or, or made inappropriate choices or something. Um, and how did those choices affect your decision? So a less successful audition. Yeah, I I think that, um, and I'm gonna struggle not to be to um, have identifying mm -hmm. information because I just also feel like, you know, if there was a better way, I'm gonna just be honest, to 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 be introduced to talent and to cast people, then auditioning, I I would do it. I, I think it is, I think it puts people sometimes in a really, like, in a, in a situation where they cannot do anything but help them be nervous. So, I, I have great empathy um, for the, for being on the other side of the process. That said, um, this actor did a piece, um, and it, we were unsure um, in the audition, it, if they were acting or not acting. And I will just be general enough to say that they were making a choice that 
was was uh, enigmatic enough to make it feel a little insane. So we were just all like, are they, is that choice yep. that they're making right now? Like a big, a big kind of grand choice to, to get our attention or are they having a moment in which they are, are you know, something mentally is right is wrong. Um, so I, I would say like, you know, make sure that if you are making really bold choices, which I which I think is good, that they're ones that are not, you know, gonna gonna shift the energy of the room in a way that is gonna just sort of make everyone feel tense for the wrong reason. Yeah, which sort of twins with what Betty said earlier about, you know, don't be so out there that right, we we have to engage with you. I I agree. I, I've been in an audition room where I I, I was unclear. I felt unsafe, and and also, you know, we're 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 trying to cast the best actor or person for the part. Um, we also want a room of really good people for whatever four weeks, say however long our rehearsal process is. So we're trying to intuit that and the two women as well. Um, so yeah, Betty, any any challenging? In general, I don't remember the bad auditions. Yeah. I just forget them, and then. An actor will come and see me a second or third time, and then we get to work together. And then they'll say, "You saw me before," and they'll say, "I did." And they'll tell me about it, and I'll go, "Oh," because I don't remember it. I don't need to store auditions where you're not succeeding, so I generally don't. There is, however, one audition that I kept for over ten years now, wow. and it, yeah, because it's distinctive. Um, the it, I was doing a, an educational theater show about stress, and the actor decided to write their own monologue about stress and i still remember the language it goes like this i'm stressed i'm so stressed man i'm stressed and then it repeated <laughs> over and over and over again for like a minute there was nothing else there was some blocking but that was it so i do remember that you can perhaps see why it is scarred on my brain and um, in terms of how did it affect they did not get called back um because they didn't show me anything that was workable so that i could give them additional information they didn't give me enough info so i had to just say thank you and move on okay um this is what I added this late, so uh, don't let it throw you. I just was wondering if you have a, like a recommendation for a book or a guide or a website or something with audition tips, anything um, you guys have done. I mean, I, I can throw out, uh, but just because I was trying to coach a teacher about auditioning um, and I went to see if there were new material. There is a book called Audition by Michael Shurtleff, which has been around for 3,000 years. Um, so it's old and I was thinking there might be something newer, but I didn't find anything. Um, that's a great text if you're looking for some text. I still, I honestly still yeah. love that one yeah, as well. Right. Um, these kind of things are a great resource uh, to talk to the people that are in the room, people that have done it, other things like that. Um, yeah, it's, it's the resource is where you find it and uh, practice is, is uh, invaluable. Uh, a bad audition might be great value for the next audition and learning what to do, what didn't work, and so on. So uh, Mother Nature has a tendency to be a really good teacher sometimes. Uh, but that's the book that I, I'm i that old. Yeah, but yeah, there it is. Take Google yeah. lists. There's a lot of lists out about the most overdone monologues mm -hmm. and songs. And there's a list that just came out like a week and a half ago. And I'm so sorry that I did not retain it. But it has the most... Um, done songs at this giant audition and it was really interesting because it literally said how many times the song was done so you could kind of like do your odds based on the number of songs i don't remember what it was so i do apologize but if you google most done songs in a, in a big audition or whatever i'm sure it'll come up but it was great it literally just had scans of all of the songs that people did and how many times that song was done so that you were able to go oh Maybe that musical that I love to do is not the one because it was done so much and it was really eye opening. But I don't remember more than that. I apologize. Okay. Hey, Manny, uh, I I am afraid that I have also not possibly read an audition. No, no worries. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. um, but you know, there's also there's 
we have so many resources now. Um, there are YouTube, and right. you know, we have AI. And, but I also like, I have to say that sometimes I think, you know, certain directors can get overly prescriptive mm -hmm. of, of what makes a good audition. And I would just go back to what I think is a kind of a resounding thing, which is be prepared to yourself. You know, I mean, have so, fun. You know, I, I, it, 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 recognizing that that's easier said than done. Yep. You know. All right, so we're going to do some some specifics. We're running out of time, so we'll try to move through these. Uh, what's the most important element of a theatrical resume, and any advice uh, you look at in terms of headshots? So. Any any headshot and resume material advice? I'll, I'll start. Yeah, I'm sure. This will be echoed. Uh, have a headshot that looks like you. Yeah, <laughs> uh, a current headshot <laughs> that looks like you. Um, re resume clean, one page, one sheet. I'm not worried about what you did in high school or 20 years ago. Um, and all of that is also really to me superfluous to what I watch in an audition. It's great information, but it isn't going to. I can't think of a time where I've ever seen somebody audition brilliantly and go, mm, this one show and that <laughs> part, I don't think so. It's it's additional information to what you do. But uh, headshot, please. Correct. Yeah. And uh, on the headshot front, yes, there are amazing photographers. And yes, great headshots often do cost. But there are also really great deals that headshot photographers will offer where they'll go, hey, you can get three looks in like X amount of time for X amount of money and just know who you are when you go to get your headshots mm -hmm. so that the photographer can capture you. I remember that when I began, I didn't know who I was or what I could do. And so I brought all these outfits and I expected the photographer to be able to tell me what I should wear, but they don't know who I am and they don't know what I do. So know something about yourself so that you can bring yourself into the element so that you can look like you and then do all the transformative things in math and go, oh my gosh, that's still you because you can do all the things. I think that, um, yeah, a really clean resume is a, a well-organized. Take the time to do that. Um, you know, I know we all have varying levels of, of organization, but it feels it, when I'm trying to find out what your credits are and you haven't bothered to make it in a readable format, it makes me feel a little like, oh, like my time's being wasted. Um, please title your your headshots and resumes the way that, that Steve said. I mean, you know, headshot 2024, like just think about how many we don't know who that is, you know, if it's in the document. I just think some of that stuff shows like a basic kind of consideration for the processing that the person on the other side does. You want to make it as easy as possible. Um, I prefer your most recent credits at the top. Um, I've seen some folks order it the other way where they sort of go chronologically, uh, but then that's going to be confusing, particularly if you've had a longer career when you're saying that you played a role that you're clearly no longer appropriate for. Um, so then I, ha I have to do some deciphering. Um, so just most recent credit at the top. And um, I would agree, like, I would much rather uh, know your progressive credits, uh, your most recent credits, than just the, like a, like, I I'm not particularly impressed just because you've been in 40 shows. So if you're if you're finding that you're having to reach way back um, to just sort of have like a, a like a, a wealth of credits, like I think that that's the that Christmas just, pageant nineteen. Yeah, yeah. Like you know, it's more important yeah. that I understand you know the work that you're proud of, the work that's you the work that's professional. Yeah, and I'll I'll just say this is my as a preference. This is not it's not required. Um, I like it when you put the director of the show. Um, that's just my personal preference because in the town I work in uh, here in the metro area, um, chances are I will know some of those people. And that's that's a really great resource for me. If like, oh, I'm not sure these two actors are amazing, but this one I know worked with my friend Betty or or my friend Amanda or my friend Robert Michael and I can call it. So I like that detail when you can do that. Not required, but just preference. What we do call 
we absolutely do call. And sometimes we don't even need to know because if you say, you know, you're in town from town hall, I'm gonna probably know who that is. Uh, but yeah, we do talk. Yeah, all right, good. Uh, piece selection. So this is just, are there audition pieces that you would not like to see again? We, we talked a little bit. I don't know if you have any personal, like, oh my gosh, I don't ever want to see. In the old days, I mean, we cycle around, you know, like the Blue Window one and uh, the Identity Crisis one with the Peter Pan and all that. I mean, there were some that cycle in and cycle out because then all the directors, like you said, a band are like, no, we don't ever want you to do this. Um, so, I mean, anything on, on your list that you don't want to see or you're all good? Yeah, I think I said earlier for me, it's just that certain kind of female material. Yeah, so I think that's a great. Yeah. I mean, but that's also just about the biking record. Yeah, yeah. Okay, good. Uh, yeah, this is do you feel strongly about actors doing original material versus something cut from an existing show? And uh, again, we sort of already covered the popular common pieces. Um, and do you care if they select the pieces based on the show? Obviously, a lot of times shows with Chris Strip like don't do anything from your in town, or you can do something from your in town if you're, you know, it's a specific show. I know I, I will usually put put that information out. Personally, I doesn't bug me at all. Um, just because I'm like, we're gonna help that me cast, and you feel like you're right for this role, go for it. But in some cases, we're just don't want to. Bother me if, so, if like someone knows I'm doing mental votes. Yeah, doing mental votes. No, I mean I'm, I'm still probably gonna if if I'm interested in them, I'm still gonna call them back. And yeah, I'm still gonna give them direction. So okay. it, it it depends. Um. So here's what I would say: if you're going for a show specific, um, you know, audition and you say, we'll just say Cinderella, and you really want to play Cinderella, but you have one specific idea for how Cinderella's played, and you're not able to shift or be malleable with direction, well, you gave us information that's going to cost you. Whereas if you just picked a different piece, mm -hmm. we could still bring you back in mm -hmm. to read for Cinderella, and you still have all options available. So it depends on you. If if you lock in and there are different performers who different who work different ways, if you lock in and you don't have the ability to shift from the way you see it, then you may not want to do that because if the director wants to give you direction, you can't take it. Um, personally, I prefer scripted material to original material. The exception to that, though, are the brilliant writers. And there are some brilliant people out there who can write pieces for themselves that are amazing. And I cannot tell that it's you until afterward when I say, where'd that piece come from? And you see the smile on my face and you're like, I wrote it. And I'm like, okay, um, all right, thank you, double -head. Unless it's, <laughs> I feel stress. Oh, I am sure. feeling stress. <laughs> right. like, and then we know it's right, yeah. Yes, then, then, then we <laughs> ask you, where'd that piece come from? Yeah. Yeah. But um, <laughs> it, it's really about picking things that you love yeah. that showcase you and your ability. That Because for every single rule we can give you, someone will come in and break the rule and we'll be thrilled that they did it. Yes. Uh, important to note that, right, there are exceptions to all of the sort of rules. Same thing. I, I don't, it doesn't bother me at all to do a, a piece from the show. It does go, here's the part you're auditioning for. Can I, it's up to me now. Can I see you as something else or did you lock me in? Um, but it doesn't bother me. Um, bring it. If that's your best foot forward, then absolutely bring it. And I'm okay with an original piece also. I know that we all hear a lot of monologues and we'll hear them and we'll be familiar enough to go, they're doing a great job with this or they yeah. have a different take. If you do an original piece, to me personally, cool. But now you have to take me on a journey and you got to tell me something and show me something because I don't know it. If it goes nowhere, that goes, what What was it? Now your writing may hinder you from a job versus if you're performing. That might be a great instance to make sure you find the pre audition. Right, exactly. Right. Right. Like, yeah. like, That's just like, driving. You know, so. mm -hmm. All right, I am going to, I'm going to skip these questions because I do want to get questions from the audience. I'll, I'll, I'll leave these up in case we don't have a lot of other questions, but do we have any questions from the audience for the panelists about any general audition? We I know we covered a few when we were dealing with logistics. Yes. 
Yes, gentlemen. Typical audition question. Two pieces. If you're a very strong Shakespearean actor, should you do a classical piece? Or because the chances of you auditioning for somebody who's going to be casting Shakespeare? Uh, it's it's a great question, especially in our town. I mean, if you're auditioning for CSF. Oh, we got to repeat it. Oh, so sorry. Yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah. The question is, should if you're a good Shakespearean actor, should you do a classical piece in your package? Um, well, really, for this for this audition or just any audition? Well, it's, well, it's yeah. Different, but as a general yeah. audition, in general, because sometimes they want two contrasting pieces. Right. They do a series, you do or do they have a choice to do a Shakespearean piece, knowing they're probably not looking to get anybody for Shakespeare? Uh, I'll answer. Um, if you do it and you do it well, hundred mm -hmm. percent, bring it, mm -hmm. because a good Shakespearean actor can do almost anything. So what you've told me is that you have a penchant for classical, but you also have a facility with text. So I would say, don't do both, even if you're brilliant at it. Also let us see something that's different. So show us something contemporary and something classical. Absolutely. If you love it, bring it. Yeah, I and we saw a, a good amount of Shakespeare last year. I mean, uh, I know there was a ton, but uh, um, we did we don't prescript that in this audition primarily because there are not a, as you mentioned not a lot of companies doing Shakespeare. There's some companies doing a little more classical kind of things. Um, but I agree with Betty 100. percent I mean, I lo I love Shakespeare and know it really well. So I love it when somebody is going to do it because I can then like talk about it. I can put that in context. If you think you're King Lear, that helps me also with sort of where you put yourself. Um, and then, yeah, if you can speak the language, I mean, we say to our students, you can do Shakespeare, you can do anything, because you're doing the character, the acting, you're doing language, you're doing poetry, meter sometimes. So, yeah, I mean, the footnote is, yeah, there's not a lot of that work, unfortunately, I think, unfortunately being done in town. Although I'm doing a Shakespeare in the summer, so uh, you can do Shakespeare for that. What is the panel's uh, meaning of uh, giving accents in the initial audit? Great, great. The question uh, is, what is the panel's opinion of using, using accents or dialects during your audition? So sort of along these, these same lines, if you do it really well and it fits the piece, great. If you have a fantastic piece, but that accent isn't quite up to speed, uh, it it it's going to detract from the work. So it's it's sort of this same thing we talk about. If it's done really well in union together, it might be a slam dunk. Uh, so, but as far as for me, I love it. Bring it, bring all of it. That's me. I would say too that if it's if it's um, if it's reflective of something that you want to demonstrate. Do you know what I mean? Like I am really good at accents or. I've auditioned, I'm from Texas, and I've auditioned with my 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 natural born accent before because it's something I can do that might be of use to the casting folks. But I wouldn't do it for the sake of doing it, do you know what I mean? Unless it's like really like in the kind of show us something about it. Yeah, I, I think all that's great. I mean, the basic advice is don't. For, especially for a generic thing like this, because you're then kind of, then we can't really hear your, but however, I think all that, if, if you've got a piece that you really connect with, that's great, that lights your fire, then, and you, and you do the accent really well, go for it. Okay, maybe? I think I'll think of it. Uh, Leah, do we have any online questions? Yes, so, sorry. Right. Um, so this is about the two audition days for the producer assignment. Are different actors auditioning on the two different days, or is it the same lineup each day? Oh, different, great question. Really great question. Um, but you want to repeat it? <laughs> oh, sorry. Sorry. Uh, the question is, is it the same lineup of actors each day, or is it different actors on Sunday versus different actors on Monday? And the quick answer is that I don't know many audition, many actors who want to go through that twice. So they don't, they just come on the one day that they're assigned. So you're either assigned on the Sunday or you're assigned to the Monday, but it is a completely different group of actors each day. 
Um, will house lights be up during the audition? The question is, will house lights be up during the auditions? I, it's a good question. We, we haven't made a final decision. I imagine they're going to be similar to how they are right now, which if you could see the theater, they're up at, I don't know, 25%, maybe 30%, a, a little bit, but not, not overwhelming. Uh -huh. And I would say that for the folks who can't see or also the folks in the audience, like I can see your faces, but not as if I'm in a room with work lights. Yeah. So... I can I, I definitely would not have a hard time sort of soft focusing you out if I if that's what I needed to do to make myself feel comfortable. Um this is more of a I think if you don't have the answer to you can I'll give you the contact info to follow up. Excellent. Um do you know how many of the auditionees last year were capped by companies? Did more actors audition? There was then there was demand for or were there not enough actors? So yeah, so yeah. I can tell you that about 180 actors auditioned last year. We do not have the statistics on who got offers because, as Becky kind of mentioned in the intro, after the days of the audition, CTG wishes all of our actors and producers well, but we are then sort of done with that process. I mean, I sort of love to know the answer to that, but I, I don't, we, we don't track that information. I mean, I do know, and I know Betty, Betty and I both that know actors that were cast because of those auditions. I, I, mean, ca I cast yeah. actors. Oh, great. The, the, yes. I, I mean, I, I called them back. Same. Yeah. And we would, we would call people back for a specific show from the Yeah. We, a local theater company, called people back, and some people got hired. And I have a lot of friends who sent me personal texts to say, oh my God, a company that I've never even been a part of sent me a callback audition and I got the gig and this is what it is and you can't tell anybody. So there were a lot of those things um, and producers who were like, I was exposed to people that I did not know and what a treat to be able to ask them to come in. And I also had producers who said, we called a lot of people back and actors were already booked, were unable to come. So the question of how many people's cast based on that is really hard because there's so many factors beyond the was a theater interested in learning more? But anecdotally, hell yes. Yeah, the, the, yes. the success of the data is much larger than did you get a role. Right. Uh, yeah. Yeah, and well, look, we're, this, this event is about hopefully trying to help you as an actor go to one audition and get exposed to a lot of different companies. There's not a whole lot of other opportunities. We really hope that that, you know, you're not, I hope it saves you from driving to, you know, 30 different auditions or or companies you would never even think about going to because, I don't know, like, like we talked about earlier, maybe you didn't think, well, maybe I could drive to Fort Collins and go to Bob Blue or, or one of the great companies that are South or North. And so you, so, I think I think the opportunity for you, the investment for you, the actor, is a possible. Um, okay, next question. I think we kind of addressed this, but I think you've been here. If we're brought into audition, how many copies of headshots should we bring? And I put a brief resume in the back of the headshot. I indicated that mostly we're doing this digital. No, we're. But I wanted to go. Yeah, we're. But so the question was just, should you bring your resume to the audition? No. It's a hundred percent digital. We we hope, knock on wood, that the if you do the application, you're going to have to upload your resume and upload your your headshot, or you might have a combined document that has both of them in one document, and you're done forever. You don't ever have to do that ever again. Well, for us, for this audition, if you get caught, the man that calls you back for a catalog show, then yes, you might need to either digitally send it to her again or upload it again. The other footnote with that is I did have actors last year who did email me. I'm the one that gets all the emails like, oh my gosh, I, I updated my headshot. Can I do a new headshot? You email me. I can't guarantee it, but generally, yes, it's not 15 minutes before the audition. I can put a new resume or headshot in. It's all digital. You don't have to copy anything. You have to print anything. It's all digital. And then we're going to pause the end. Go ahead. Um, so for those of do things. Um, yeah, well, I'm kind of like, so I think I want to do two models, but I do say I have a lot of people here on my resume. How likely is it that directors will see that and be like, okay, I like her two models, and maybe I want to call her back? 
I, I, my advice to you, oh, so sorry. The question was, if, if you experienced musical theater actor, should you do, uh, you know, and you don't do a song, do, do you think uh, uh, the producers will, you know, see that on your resume and call you back for musicals? My advice to you is to do a song because there's lots of musical theater. This gentleman produces a lot. I direct a lot of musical theater. There's a lot in town. And it's just that it's a skill that's very hard for us to intuit, even if we're like, oh my God, she's played Mrs. Lovett. And I oh wow, oh my God. Um, but I, I would just advise you in this situation, because you're like, you're getting it out there, you're trying to show all of your talents, do your best piece, whatever it is, um, but also sing, because again, it, it's hard. Yes, of course we can see that, but it'll will tag you immediately as possible musical theater if you sing. And what I would say is if, because you you know that you can sing and that you have sung a lot, but you really wanted to focus on the acting, which I hear, mm -hmm. what I would say is craft your pieces so that you give us 15 seconds of song. You don't have to give us a lot in order for us to know yeah. that you can sing. So that way you can focus on what you want to focus on, which is the monologue performance, but you can still give us enough to go, oh, okay. They can sing, and that's all you need. So it's not that you have to do a whole song. You don't have to do 16 bars. You can cut it any way you want. So that's what Steve was talking about when he talked about the creative selection process. You can do a, a short bit. And, it, and as a musical theater performer, you know the things you can do that tell the story, that hit the note, that give us the information, but don't have to take a lot of time. So that might be the solution to accomplishing what you seem to want to yep. do while still giving people that, hey, they sing. Yeah, and I would also just think about, you know, what what is what are the songs in your repertoire and how can you make a great acting song? You know what I mean? A song yeah. that's charged acting-wise, and there are a ton of them. But again, I love the maybe shorten it, depending on kind of what you're wanting to do. Again, have fun with that two-minute, one-woman show, you know? Perform the song. Yeah, uh, it it becomes a monologue to somebody like me that's listening as as a music theater person. Performing a song is a skill uh, in addition to singing it, and if yeah. you perform it, that is a monologue to yeah. me. So, yeah. absolutely, good point. If I look at the list of companies that you did, and I see a particular um, season that I'm interested, do as directors recommend? Hey, reaching out to the director or so the question is, uh, should you reach out to individual theaters if you see that they attended the Unifieds and their seasons are interesting to you? Yeah. I have had people contact me after the audition, um, and I love it. I do. I mean, it's not not for any sort of way. Like, it just again humanizes what can feel like a kind of we we have a really human art form, and so that you know it was great to see you there. I like to have my season. Looks really interesting. I'm articulate. Absolutely. I mean, I think that you might you might not hear back, right? Depending on the level of busyness or how many actors. But but I think it's a I think it's a great yeah, it's, it's not it's not bad form in my book at all. Yeah. I, again, I would just say don't don't expect response just because we might not be ready, but yeah, and I would also say that it it's a gift if you're interested in a company to add them to your group and whenever you're doing something, they just get one quick email telling them that you are doing X show at X place for this many dates. If we're able to, it puts you on our radar. Um, one of the things that happens, at least to me, and they can tell you if it happens to them, is that throughout the year, I can name so many incredible performers. As soon as I'm directing a specific piece where I have a specific <laughs> need, I can't remember a specific performer. It's not wrong. Right? It just happens when you go blank. And so hopefully you gave yourself enough time for your memory to return. But having that memory of, oh, yeah, this person's interested in your yep. work, interested in working with you, isn't a negative. Note is just one email. It's 
you know, it's not the constant barrage of, did you get my email? Did you get my email? Hey, I emailed you, or you don't do that. But just letting us know that you're interested and letting us know the work that you do. Most of us want to know, and if we're able to, we want to come see you because that is a billion times better than auditions. Getting to see you in your element on stage is where we learn the most about you. So if we're interested, we want to come out and see you in your element. And then when we come into an audition, we have additional information. And so if you're nervous, we know where you can go because we've already seen you instead of being a one-shot deal. And this is the only time it puts it up. And we do, those are moments where uh, we do learn a lot of going and seeing a show and saying, hey, I, I saw this show, Betty, who was this person? that was in this, in Women on Boats Week, who was played this, I want to know who that was. They were spectacular. I have a thing for them. I want them to audition. That that truly does happen. Um, we get exposed to people and we have to reach out and find out more. We want them to, we want them to come in and, and we want to know more. Yep. Leah? Um, huh? I had my full time, so I'm just yep. going to well, it's, we're okay for now. Um, but, yeah. It's when Shakespeare's soliloquy where he wants to direct them. He wants us to look at you at the chair. Uh, at the this is the first question that we did not answer, uh, which was, what are your thoughts about whether an actor should look at the auditor during their pieces? So why don't we why don't we go through and, and answer this one? Do you guys have preference about that? Because uh, I mean, I think one of Ben, you kind of answered this uh, with, with the you're making notes. Uh, yeah, I, <laughs> it all depends is where I'm going to start my answer. Where you put the person you're talking to matters. So Steve gave an example of if I'm in a chair and Robert's in a chair, but Robert can't be seen by y'all and I'm just doing this the whole time, that may not be very interesting to you all just seeing me in profile. So I might put my imaginary Robert here or here so that I'm playing to that person. You see me looking at that person, but I'm not upstaging myself. So I would say don't upstage yourself. And there are pieces that are definitely direct address. What I would say to you is know that you risk alienating some of your audience because there are audience members who do not want you to establish eye contact with them. And then there are audience members who are like, yeah. So you have to know what it is that you're doing, why you're doing it, and who the target audience is. If you're a person who does immersive work, that may work for you. But if you do a lot of other things, it may not. So it's not cut and dry to me. I think, I think even, for folks who are wanting to do immersive work, I don't think I, this context is the right one to make yeah. eye contact. Yeah. I, I agree, and I think it's it really Betty mentioned it before, but for me, I do not like an actor to look at me, and all of the people on the panel are all actors, at least we were at one point. Um, so if you look at me and you're emoting and you're a great actor, like I want to give you to the scene. I mean, Amanda said, right, the stupid thing, auditioning, it's stupid. We haven't figured out a better way to do it in 3,000 years. I mean, I don't know how Euripides did it, but <laughs> you've been doing theater for a long time. And it's hard because we're asking you to do something fake, which is, you know, make a personal connection to the exit sign in the back of the room. But we have another job, which is to write down, oh, my gosh, this person is so great. I got to remember that. That's perfect for this role in my next show or, or whatever we got to do. And if we're engaged with you, we're going to have nothing on our sheet and it'll be hard. Okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm saying just pick pick an ear, shoot past me this way, <laughs> shoot over my head this way. I want to see your face, but I, I don't want to make hard eye contact. It's going to make your piece awkward for both of us. Absolutely. Especially if you're way out there, which I know we sort of advised yeah. against. Uh, yes, don't scare us. Leah, any, yes. any? Um, What are the panel's thoughts about choosing monologues to play where the character is a different gender, race, or age? Excellent question. Excellent question. Could I repeat it? Uh, yes, uh, what uh, that the, okay. the panel has been asked what our thoughts are on picking a monologue which has a different gender or race than the character. You're 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 not the right race or gender for the character as an age as set up in the play. All right. 
It's a really good I, question. I think, um, I think gender makes this that's fine, depending on. I mean, if you're a white person, you should not do it. That was it for an object. Can you speak up a little bit? Yeah, I just, I'm just, it's like, you know, <laughs> <laughs> it's, yeah, it's, like, it's hard, right? Like, if you are a white actor, you should not do a, no, I, 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 you should not do an And you should not do, and I, you should probably not do a, um, uh, like, Lincoln, the real famous Latino actor who has great stuff. No, I'll think of it in a second. But anyway, I just think you know, I think it's important to be sensitive in a day and age about that kind of stuff. But I, I think that gender, age, that I mean, some of that stuff, I think can be fluid. Yeah, I would say play with gender. Um, I certainly prefer a lot of the male monologues in Shakespeare to the female. And I've put in the work and I've done them and succeeded. So I'm I'm pro that. Age is an interesting question for me because in college, often we're given roles that we will never get outside of college. And I don't want to see someone who reads as 21 talking about how their joints hurt at 60. I don't want to see it. I just don't, because I'm like. You're not. I, I so it, it depends on what the role is and if it's something that you can play. Because conversely, I know people at 21 who were playing roles for 50 because that's all they were going to do because that's who they were. They were character actors from the start. And so go for it. it. It's just not cut and dry. What I would say is if you're 20 and you're talking about how old you are, but you look like you're 17, that's probably not a good idea. Um, if you cannot believably convey whatever the character needs, don't do it. And if you know that the words coming out of your mouth now are going to cause a ripple in the room that was not intended by the playwright, you probably shouldn't do it. That, all of that <laughs> is correct. Uh, yes, if, if if you think it might be cringy, it might be cringy. Um, be, be thoughtful about all of those things. Be aware of all those things. Same thing. Gender doesn't bother me at all. A piece age is relevant to what you're doing. And if you can't apply some lived experience, I probably won't believe you uh, on some level. So be thoughtful of that. And then once we get into race and culture and stuff like that, be very hyper vigilant and aware of what you are doing and be real sure that you should. And there's a question in the back. Uh, in general, uh, during audition, what is the year to know what you look like? <laughs> <laughs> That's a great question. How do you can do I bet we all do it very, very different. Uh, I bet we do too. Yeah, the question is um, when we're attending an audition on the producing side, what do our notes look like? What kinds of things do we notate? So I, I'll, I'll just give you a first version and, and people can expand on it because I don't want to spend all of my time writing. I want to spend more watching. So I use a sort of a short numbering system on kind of a one to five, uh, five good uh, on singing, on uh, acting. And then I will make notes of character, loved character, brought interesting intention. I'll just, I'll try to hit specific words that mean something to me when I look back at it. So I'll have a number and a number, and then I'll have some very specific words that mean something to me as I watch it. That's what I do. Uh, okay. Um, I write things like, look like photo, don't look like photo. <laughs> photo was 20 years ago. I write those notes to myself so that I don't get tricked up because my, my mind has one memory and the photo is something different, so I'm telling my mind it's okay. Um, I will write really quick things like love, love, um, really enjoy, interesting. Interesting means like this person's making me think, like they are not like what I what I imagine. Like I write words that mean something to me. Um, if they sing, I'll write singer, um, 
ensemble, if they're like not a soloist, I'll like write notes like that to myself. Um, I will write something about what they did. So if, they, if there was contrast, I'll write contrasting, check, or no contrast. Um, I write little things to myself to help me remember as much as possible. And if I know the pieces, I'll write really slayed, blah, 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 so that I go, okay, Julia, I got you. And I'll write those things so that I can remember as much about their pieces. And the number one thing that I write, either using uh, symbols like Robert Michael, is like CB, call back, um, check, check 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 like I want to see them again or um don't know if there's anything there because if we spent two minutes and I just couldn't tell it sometimes I write just see again question mark question. so I just write question marks if there's something weird or happened or if something odd happened like like the tripping or falling I'll just write notes like sort of stuff like that so I just try to give myself as much as I can so that I will remember that person because 50 people in, it becomes hard unless I help my brain. Yeah, I I um, I don't write notes if it's an actor that I don't think is right for any project that I'm working on. I just sort of like, and generally I'm like, I will just watch and, you know, um, be, hold space for this person that, and it, because usually it, it's totally for reasons that have nothing to do with. <laughs> With what they are doing up there, um, I tend to uh, mostly focus on like would be good for this show, young, could play this role, um, and then if I don't think I have something for them and anything that I have on the horizon, but I think they're awesome, then I'll write that. Like, don't think I have anything for them, but want to keep an eye out because they're. And something interesting that happened last year is that we had a good like 30 seconds to write about performers after the audition. So once we figured that out as producers, it allowed us to be able to center in and watch because we knew that once they were done, we were able to go. <laughs> so that was a gift that doesn't always happen with generals because it's just so quick and those time slots are there that you sometimes just have to write or type the entire audition to be able to capture. Yep. Yeah, I, 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 maybe I'm old school. I, I do a grading system like A to F kind of thing. Um, and a lot of times it'll be like A minus B plus. Um, but I do that because especially in this kind of audition, although in, for musicals, usually you're looking at, I mean, we looked at like 150 people for Matilda when I did it at Town Hall. So you're trying to put them, and you, you got to be good at decision making if you're going to be a director. So you got to like get away from them. Maybe it's not. No, I love their grade. They're probably better than you know. So you, do, I just do a quick grade so that I can compare. Sometimes it's like two actors that are, are up for them one role. I'll look at that for this. I do that because I like to have grade for a monologue, a grade for the song or the second monologue. So I just have a sort of a sense of what my take on was for that 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 person. Okay, I think we've got. Uh, let's say two more questions. We'll can do one. One online and one live, if we've got one, one live. Um, yeah, should we avoid songs with difficult accompaniment? So, <laughs> example, get an RRG Robert Brown cannon or Tom. Would you repeat the question? Yes. Uh, should you uh, avoid songs that have difficult accompaniment, like Sondheim? My answer is yes. Uh, avoid that because even if it's the greatest thing you do, you're meeting an accompanist for the first time. And Jason Robert Brown might not be their best foot forward, which will impact your uh, audition. So think user friendly, don't sell yourself short, but really complicated things can create really complicated problems. I'm going to give one caveat. Have your sheet music, ask the accompanist, how are you with Sondheim, mm -hmm. with this song? And if they're like, ah, oh, yeah. Give it to them. And if you're like, do you, they're like, mm -hmm. hi, here's the second song. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? That way you still have total agency because our company is amazing, but just because you're amazing doesn't mean you're great at everything. So asking the question in that quick two, 10 seconds gives you the ability to go, okay, great. Then I'm giving you this instead of this. That way you don't have to give up on that piece that you love because if they know it, then you guys can tear it up together. Yeah, it's a, it's a good, the, also the good advice there too is, have multiple things ready. 
Um, when when I have done audition coaching in the past, I like actors to have, you know, if you're doing one monologue, one song, have at least two monologues and two songs. And professional actors got thousands and probably ready at any one time. But if you're new to it, have two because in the night before you might be like, oh, gosh, you know, I really like this, and that gives you more choice and agency over that. And then Betty's point's a great one. Then you could be like, yeah, you've got a second choice. It's great. Yeah. Uh, can you recommend a comfortable way to segue from one monologue to the next? Um, and when you're all done, you like this, that, 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 all folks, take a bow. Or... Um, my, Ask the question. Yeah, okay, sorry. Uh, the question is how do you segue from one monologue to the song or a song to the monologue or two monologues or one monologue to the other monologue? And how do you finish? So I think it's a great question. My, I mean, my, my advice for the segue, you just have to figure out what that journey is. Sometimes turning around can work. You don't have to do that, but sometimes that can work. The, the key thing is that you keep the action fluid so that we don't really know when you've changed your character. You know what I mean? It's because it's a one person show. You're you're never out of character. That's my basic advice for that, but there's no you know ironclad rule. I personally just like a thank you in your real voice uh, when you're done. That just makes it so, especially if there's some pretty dramatic pause at the end of your piece. Some, sometimes we're not sure you're done. So it's nice, you know, thank you. And then you're you're out. Take several bows. You probably have bows. Back, 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 back to the play when we cast. Yeah. The other thing I would say about transition, uh, which is a little different than Steve's, is I don't need you to continue being fluid. I really want to know when one piece has ended and when the next piece has begun. And sometimes it's so, it's just like, and that we, we're like, is that a second piece? And we can't tell. I want to know it's yeah. a second piece. So whether it's a moment, a breath, a physicalization, something definitive that helps me to know that you are no longer in what was and you have moved on to the what is. That's that's what I need because then I know what you can do, especially if I'm casting for multiple roles. I have a sense of what you might do. I just don't want to be confused. Yep. Is there a physical change between yeah. monologues is a real simple way to communicate that. So um, if one thing is standing and the next is seated, but it's a real simple thing, but if you don't want to sit, like just, you know, being oriented this way for monologue one and then changing, you know, to the to, from stage right to stage left, making it really distinct, a breath. Yep. So great question. Okay, why don't we do, we're going to do one more line and then we're going to be done and then people in the audience will be in the lobby so you can ask us more if you've got one. Yeah. So do a final online. question. Um, Regarding headshot, like if you're not able to do a professional headshot, are you going to take down the marriage? <laughs> <laughs> like, so the, is there judgment against someone getting a non-professional? Question is: Is there judgment against doing a non-professional headshot if you can't afford uh, the fees to get that done? No, and don't do a selfie. I, and, and I don't, I'm not trying to be funny. Like, I just, I think that they, I mean, I'm not even kidding, but like during the pandemic, I really got an old headshot and I really needed a new one. And I had my daughter take her Canon and take a picture of me on my balcony. You know, like, I mean, I think just do whatever you can, like look at other headshots and approximate it as best as possible. And the only reason is that, I mean, for me, I'm, casting professional work so i don't know how to say this except for that like i do want to know that you can um, make some choices even if you don't have the resources to um to get yourself into a professional space yeah i would back that up with do the best you can with what you've got to work with uh that shows me something Consistent with with what you look like. I mean, I just need to fill that purpose, uh, and I don't need I don't need to spend a thousand dollars for me to get there. Uh, maybe you land this job and then you can afford to do other headshots, but I'm I'm fine with uh, a good likeness. Everything that they said is true. I would say um, I want to amplify what Amanda said. Really study what other headshots look like, because that's the key. If 
if if you show me a, a, a candid shot of you in action, I'm not clear if you are a performer, if you're an aspiring performer, it, I don't know based on your photo. So I would say, think of your photo as the first introduction that a stranger gets to who you are and what you do. And so as long as you look at it from that lens, the cost point isn't what's important. It's about what we're seeing as the image and making sure that the focus is on you and not your background. Those are the kinds of things that professional photographers do in their sleep because they've trained to do it. We just want to make sure that we're focused on you and not on your jewelry, not on the scenery behind you. We want to see you. Great answer. Uh, okay, so I'll just I'll or we're going to end with this little quote from Michael Shirtliff, assuming you want to you want to get the book, which I just think is really great. It's great acting advice, but it's great as you think about what you're trying to do, which is. Listening is not merely hearing, it's receiving the message that is being sent to you. That might be being sent to you by an imaginary character in an audition. Listening is reacting. Listening is being affected by what you hear. Listening is letting it land before you react. Listening is letting your reaction make a difference. Listening is active. Too many actors make listening a passive process. We thank you so much for being here today. We've got lots of thank yous. We want to thank everybody at the Aurora Fox, both for tonight's workshop, as well as for hosting the auditions coming up in April, uh, Rich and Jennifer, uh, as well as the amazing Abner Genesee, who's the chair of the workshop committee, T. David Rutherford, also Leah Kosach, who I didn't put up, up here, but is helping us with, uh, with uh, social media. Uh, Brian Miller, also doing tech, Benny Hart, of course, the workshop committee and our panelists. Thank you, everybody. Uh, final final words. Uh, Would panel? you all join me in thanking our esteemed panel tonight? This fantastic with Wilson, Benny Hart, Robert Michelson, and the great Steve Wilson. Thank you so much. We wish you the best with your audition pieces in April. Um, any information that you may need, uh, you can go to coloradotheaterguild.org once again, and please join us for refreshments afterwards. Thanks. Great, and we'll, we'll answer questions in a lot of those so you can stay. Um, so if you've got more, uh, let us know. Thank you so much. <laughs> All right.